Hi Church, my name's Jenny and I'm part of Central Campus and based in the East Region and part of the prayer team. Today I've been asked to share a bit with you about my church relationships. Now just recently we've just had Festival Manchester with lots of churches coming together with bands, rides, ice cream, people I've not seen for ages and that is my kind of place. We went on a Saturday and there was a long queue for like, well, everything. So Steve, my husband and I decided to divide and conquer. So he joined the Bouncy Castle queue with Josh, our eight year old, while I headed over to the ice cream van and got used to the idea that queuing would just be part of the day and asked God to send me someone to make the most of the time while I was waiting in this queue. Within a few minutes, I was no longer at the end of the queue as it started to build across the field behind me. But after staying a brief high, I got chatting to the girl next to me and gradually found out that we both came to audacious different services. And we also followed a similar line of work and also as well as a love of ice cream. So 90 minutes later, I not only came away with an Oreo Sunday, but some encouraging conversations and a new friend. Hiya, Nikki. If you're watching, it was great to meet you. After enjoying the children's choir and some of the acts as the day went on, it was time to go home. But just as we were leaving, we bumped into some friends we used to do in a youth group with, but hadn't seen each other in person for over 10 years or more. Needless to say, it was another half hour, another hour or so of catching up and reminiscing about Message 2000 and the good old days and feeling old before we finally headed home. But what fun it was. When we get it right, there is something about being a Christian that whenever we meet each other, whether a complete stranger in another part of the world or friends who go back years, whatever church you walk into, it should feel like home. Whenever we meet other people of faith, there be some, should be some sort of connection because as God intended, we are all family. We are all heirs to the same promise of eternal life and share the same Holy Spirit and the same precious Lord Jesus. Today, I just wanted to remind you that this church family is a major part of God's master plan. So, in one of the last recorded prayers of Jesus, just before he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, so we knew what was coming, we find the passage in John 17, 20, where Jesus had just prayed for himself and his face and his face is across. He prayed for the disciples that would have strength who were, as they were in the garden with him. And then he prays for those who will believe in me through the disciples' message. And that is us. So John 17, 20, 23, Jesus prayed. My prayer is not for them alone, just his disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Wow, how amazing. And what a miracle. A church where we are all in complete unity with Jesus and with the Father and with each other too. What a church that is. And Jesus says, because of this, everyone will know that you are his disciples. Because of our love for each other, that is our hallmark of our relationship with God. Yes, Jesus' intention in dying on the cross was to save us from our sin, and our personal relationship with him is really important. But the full extent of his glory and the complete reason why he came and work to do was so that we, the church, may be one, as Jesus and the Father are one, Jesus in us and the Father in Jesus, so that we may be brought to complete unity. Throughout history, it's just been about God wanting to be with his people and united with us. Earlier on that evening, after washing the Jesus, uh, disciples' feet, Jesus had taught the following. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this will everyone know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And that's in John 13, 34. So our unity and love for each other is what will bring others to Christ. And part of this amazing community of believers. Now Jesus wasn't messing around. He wasn't talking about a nice feeling, about being polite or just getting along. Everyone's going to get along together or some random free love concept. 
He knew that there was no such thing as free love. He knew that love like that comes at a cost. And at the point where we find him praying for us as a church to be united, it's just before he's arrested and crucified. And Jesus was only too aware of that cost. But he decided that that price was worth paying for us to be united with him and the Father. And the only way to do this was through his own body and his own blood, his own sacrifice for us on the cross. Just before Jesus had prayed this prayer, he'd led the disciples in the first Lord's Supper, or today, what we call communion. And Paul talks about communion in 1 Corinthians 11. He talks about the seriousness and symbolism of taking part of, in this new covenant in Jesus, Jesus, even though it is a covenant of love. So when you take communion, whether your communion elements look like this, as we've got here, the traditional bread and wine, or whether it's one of these, which is part of um, often what we do at Audacious for practical reasons, but we know that in his blood and body we are all united together, then this is how we should approach it. In 1 Corinthians 11, 26, Paul starts, for I received from the Lord what I also passed to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he goes on to say, so then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord, because we're not in the covenant with him. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. This is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. This is pretty serious stuff. But in Matthew 5, 23, at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus says, Therefore, if you are offering a gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. So before we're back at church on Sunday, celebrating together, or we have the opportunity to take communion, why not take some time now just to examine your heart? If there's anything between you and God, then confess it and accept forgiveness. And if there's anyone that you have something against or something that isn't quite right with, then why not forgive or ask for forgiveness and make it right before we're next together so that we can be united in him. Then, as a result of his sacrifice, for which you are eternally grateful, we can rejoice together and love one another as a church, which is in complete, complete unity and the answer to Jesus' prayers. Bless you, church, and may your small groups be places where God loves run deep. Love. God's love runs deep. <laughs> May we be a demonstration of God's love to all that we meet. Have a brilliant day.